All right, so thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. This is, of course, the second in this eight-part series to complement your in-person training for the Miami Heritage Response Team. These programs are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's been a little while since our first presentation in the series, but we'll really pick up the pace with these programs in the coming weeks. Uh, we have a session next week on painting salvage and then the week right after on photograph and electronic media salvage. A uh, reminder that if you are unable to attend one of these live sessions, I will contact you with a recording of the program, a, your, a URL to access that recording, uh, and then I'll just ask that you notify me when you've finished viewing the session. Please make sure that you have completed viewing all eight of these programs before our next in-person training session, which will be held Monday and Tuesday, October 16th and 17th. Before we dive into today's presentation, uh, just a quick refresher of our technical notes for these sessions. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side, which I see that many of you have found. Um, we'd, love, we'd love for you to use this chat box to say hello to each other, um, to share any relevant information or links, and of course, to ask questions. If you do post a question in the chat box, you'll receive a response from me. Uh, all questions will be noted, collected, and then I will verbally ask them of our presenter during a break in the presentation. So all questions will be addressed, but we'll make sure to do that when there's a natural break in the content. I'm very pleased to introduce to you all today's presenter, Randy Silverman. Randy has served as preservation librarian at the University of Utah's Marriott Library since 1993. He teaches workshops on disaster planning for the Western States and Territories Preservation Assistance Service, also known as WestPass, and is recognized for his national disaster recovery efforts. He has 80 professional publications and has presented professional lectures or workshops in 30 states and 13 foreign countries. He was awarded the American Library Association's Banks Harris Preservation Award in 2013, received a Fulbright Specialist Award in 2014, and was given the Utah Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters Gardner Prize for, quote, outstanding academic contributions in 2016. Randy is also a member of the National Heritage Responders team and has shared his depth of knowledge with that group for many years now. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn things over to Randy for his presentation on book and paper salvage. Oh, thank you very much, Jess. I'm so flattered um, by your kind comments. And it's such a privilege to be here with all of you. It's um, obviously not quite here. I'm in Utah, but I, I have been where you are, actually. I was born in Hollywood, Florida. That's what I mean. That's a joke. They're not funny, but that's the best we can do. I'd like to um, share a whole bunch of information with you in a short amount of time. I hope it generates some uh, questions or concerns uh, try we'll try and iron those out, but I'm just going to charge into this. It's funny talking to a screen and not really seeing uh, your faces. So it's it's the way it's got to be. So let's start with the premise. There is a big storm, right? You guys know this. It's Miami, right? This is the way it goes. This is actually Katrina. That was a big storm. And when stuff happens, you know, there's going to be consequences. This is a, a slide of a library that was um, uh, flooded in Colorado due to a flash flood. The library floor filled up with water for uh, completely to the ceiling and it stayed underwater for 24 hours. So what do you do, right? So I've tried to figure out the best things to tell you in sequential order. It doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be what you want to do first, second, and third. But be aware of the concept of water-soluble coatings because they're going to stick together. So there may be nothing you can do about that. Um, it may take days to get to a site, and things are going to start to stick together. One of the things in books to be aware of is uh, coated stock papers. Coatings on papers are like a Time magazine or a National Geographic. It's a slick surface. It was put there to provide a very even flat surface for printing from uh, lithographic pre printing presses. And so a lot of material has become coded over time. It starts in probably the, um, I guess you could think 1800, but there are coatings before that. There are clay coatings in the 18th century. 
And you can't know necessarily looking at a paper if the coating is actually water soluble, which is means everything that's slick basically has the potential to stick together as it starts to dry. And the, the speed with which it's going to dry is going to be based on whether things are staying wet or whether it's very humid or what's happening. But taking a whole bunch of stuff out of a wet situation and letting it sit somewhere while we think about it may allow it to stick together and it's not reversible. So in this picture, what we're looking at are people at a workshop slip sheeting silicone release paper, which is a little like wax paper, but silicone release paper uh, doesn't wet out the way wax paper does, so it stays dry. Separating the coated stock pages is the way to prevent them from sticking together. It makes it very bulky for the book. Um, when this is, and so it's a critical decision right from the beginning. Do the uh, National Geographics need to be um, interleaved with silicon release paper? As soon as you actually try doing this, you're going to realize it's expensive, it's time consuming, and you're going to lose other stuff while you're doing the one piece. So maybe getting a sense that, you know, a specific group of things are more, more valuable or less likely to be replaceable. And I, I'm always reminded of um, people's yearbooks, They're, you know, high school yearbooks with writing from their teachers and, and uh, you know, friends are really valuable to people. And when they get wet, and they get wet a lot, if they're not separated uh, immediately, they will block together. So blocking is what we call that. With film, microfilm especially, the old adage was keep it wet. It's probably a thought to keep all photographic media wet, but it's not practical to think, well, I'm just going to take the photo collection, one million objects, and we're going to throw them in the in the water because there was a disaster. I, it's, you know, it's not what we actually do. But with microfilm, the idea of separating a ro roll of film once it starts to uh, dry out is basically impossible. So keeping it wet and getting the film to a microfilm reprocessor where they'll actually wash it and run it through a machine uh, as though it was being processed for the first time and dry it is uh, recommended. But in the real world, you can also just unroll a reel of microfilm and dry it. And the way you um, do that is, is tricky because they're very long. So do we have a clothesline that could accommodate that or several points in a room that we could uh, stretch lines and then uh, drape long film over that? That may be one option. Photographs are the big trick um, and it's the secret I want to pass along to you if it's not already known to you. My uh, experience with Katrina was the biggest loss everybody experienced. And these are people that lost their homes and cars and all their possessions. And they would tell me about the box of family photographs that they, you know, really, really wish they had taken with them. And so I'm always caught with the heartbreak that that represents for people. Certainly in institutions, the photographs could represent documentation on the collection which may hinge, uh, may be a deciding factor in getting uh, compensation from FEMA, for instance, if it's a nationally declared emergency. So the documentation may be uh, more than sentimental, it may be critical. Separating the photographs while they are still wet is the simple answer to, you know, ensuring that they're not going to be lost. Will they, you know, have water spots? Yes. Will they stick to, you know, will they um, curl? Will they have dirt on them? All of the above are possible. You can rinse if there's enough time, you know, and we have to first figure out what's happened and how fast we need to respond. But if there's time, we can actually take wet photographs and put them through clean baths of water and then spread them out. But all we have to do is separate them. You can also, and this is maybe more complicated, and I don't know if my arrow shows up on your screen. Does my arrow show up, Jess? I don't know. Uh, I'm not seeing it right now, Randy. So but, imagine uh, somebody in Utah pointing to the bottom. So this is the board on the bottom. Uh, on top of that is an absorbent material. I have access to blotter, but absorbent material might also represent newsprint, might represent paper towels. And uh, so absorbent material, a photograph, and the photograph in the middle of this pile of stuff has the image facing upward. On top of that, so the photographic media, which is gelatin, doesn't stick to the blotter on top of it, we have a sheet of Holitex or Pellon. Holitex or Pellon, Pellon is the, the name they use in a sewing store. 
This is the Pellon without heat application adhesive on it. It's just plain Pellon, which means it's available at your Joann's sewing store by the bolt. So you can get this stuff, maybe $2 a yard, and cut it to fit um, you know, specific sizes. You can get absorbent material, you know, various sources, even newspaper will work. And so the Holitex is placed on top of the um, photograph. Holitex is just a better quality Pellon. On top of that is um, another absorbent material, a blotter, and then a board and a slight weight. And the way this looks in practice is like this. Sorry, the slide looks washed out. Jeff is uh, taking a bunch of book jackets off of wet books and putting them in blotters. There, the adhesive is on, the coating is on the surface, so we're not worried about Holitex underneath. If the photograph had if it was a negative and it's got it's the negative a negative piece of film will only have gelatin on one side of it but to prevent you from having to worry about which side that is you can put holitex both above and below it and then absorbent material in his hand he has a piece of blotter and on top of that he's going to put a, um, weights and a board so the trick is the water from the wet medium which in this case was uh, book jackets that have a coating on them but it could be photographs. Um, the water will transfer through the holitex and or directly into the blotter on the bottom. And so the blotter is going to be holding the water. So after a while, however, you know, and in a disaster, all of this is relative. It may take you um, three hours to get back around to the pile if it's a small event, and it may take a day if it's a huge event. Depends also on the number of people you have. So the fact that you guys are such a big group, it might be great if you were able to pool your resources in a time of need. But the blotters here have to be exchanged for dry blotters. They can be dried. If it's newsprint, it might be just as quick to throw it away and start with dry newsprint. But absorbent material will take the water out of the wet medium in about three or four exchanges. So it, things will dry out in a stack like that. And the benefit to doing this is when paper dries under pressure, it will tend to dry more flat. So if the adhesive isn't a problem, it's not gonna, gonna stick to the blotter above it, um, life can be good. And we can make big stacks, um, you know, infinitely tall until they start toppling over, but it helps us uh, save space. So stabilizing the books and paper. This is maybe also could have been the first section, right? But what do we do about stabilizing and then drying? And sometimes it's kind of the same, same stroke. This is Jefferson Davis uh, Presidential Library in Biloxi, Mississippi after Katrina. It faces the Gulf of Mexico and the tidal surge went right through the first floor and took the collection out about a half a mile out the back door. And um, interestingly, the second floor was un unaffected, right? It just blew through the bottom and upstairs there were things that were damaged like files. Well, this was actually in a file cabinet that was on the ground. So we, we salvaged this cabinet and things were so swollen, you, we couldn't even pry them out. It was really kind of a trick. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, okay, we find things in the condition that we find them and we're going to try and put them in a place that would be more stable. So in in this case, what happened, uh, this is at the, the, old, the old state capital for Mississippi. The collection storage was damaged. The, the roof uh, was damaged for the building. And the water fell, you know, came through the roof into the collection storage. Because of fast work on the part of the collections people, they were able to get right in there like a day after the storm. And they took the collections out and they spread them around this building, which is also the, they, they work there as a, a working legislature. So they have carpet and they have you know, um, I think they're courts in, in this building. Anyway, they have very nice uh, facilities. So they put down plastic sheeting so they wouldn't damage the carpet and everything else. The problem being a plastic, a sheet of plastic directly underneath media will trap water. And so in the case of um, the swords that came out of storage, it trapped water and things rusted. So what would be preferable is to have a plastic sheet to protect whatever's under it and then Paper, newspaper would be fine. <clears throat> Something that will subdivide the, uh, will give the water some place to soak into 
and be distributed out um, around the bottom of, say, the, the swords to help prevent rusting. So in this case, uh, I traveled to Mississippi with Gary Frost. The chairs in, this is back upstairs in that um, Jefferson Davis Presidential Library. The uh, chairs are being protected with some plastic sheets and then uh, a, a layer of cardboard to, to allow the water to um, uh, be absorbed by capillary action into the cardboard away from the objects and then just allowing things to air dry, so stabilizing them. We didn't get to Mississippi for three weeks after the storm. It took a while to get there. So you'll notice mold on everything. That's kind of a byproduct of the time involved. But this is just an example. We've got things that were part of the collection, uh, books and framed paintings and pictures that are um, being dried upstairs in a dry space, and there's plenty of airflow because the bottom floor has been blown out. This is Gary working at a um, university um, uh, some miles away. And again, we're taking the material that's critical for the institution, prioritizing it, spreading it out to dry. In this case, what was happening when we showed up, people were busy putting, th all. whenever the mold would occur, they put the moldy objects inside of black plastic garbage bags because they didn't want to, quote, infect the rest of the collection. I'm going to speak about mold at the end of this talk. But um, our, our routine was to just take everything out of the plastic bags, figure out what was uh, most critical, spread it out so it could dry. And in a drier state, the mold will stop being active. But I'll talk about that later. So the pack out. In a, in a library sense, pack out just means getting standard paper box, um, paper boxes, paperboard boxes, and lining them with black plastic garbage bags. That makes them uh, watertight. You can put a lot of uh, wet books inside of a box that's been lined with a black plastic garbage bag. And uh, this is a flood at uh, Colorado State University, that one with the books arcing up on the top shelf. So almost a half a million books got wet. And so the deal was the library was no place to dry them. Upstairs was humid, everywhere around was flooded. And so we had to um, think about stabilizing things by moving them off site and freezing them. I'll make a point in a minute. We also located them by putting information on the side of the boxes. It was chaos in terms of what happened to the books when this water came in. A lot of books washed off the shelves. And so we figured out a system for gridding the, you know, making a grid of the whole basement that got wet and then marking which boxes came out first, second, and third. So in practice, we knew roughly what part of the um, floor they came from. If we're moving um, seven or eight paintings, it, it's going to be much more specific. You're going to want to know where, um, where the, how many paintings left. Was it six or seven? And where did they go when they got there? And somebody at the other side can you know, radio you back and say, yes, we received all six paintings. And you're scratching your head going, wait, wait, wait. How many did we send again? And which, which one? Where's that Rembrandt? You know? So we want to be careful. The trick is where are we going to move things? So we can move things if they're going to be dried um, to a different building. And that's, again, a great thing about Miami being such a great um, cohesive bunch of people in that you can collaborate in terms of uh, talking about shared space, but you can also use abandoned uh, buildings, you know, empty buildings, and, and try and control the humidity in those buildings and or create a space like this. But in my world, Whenever I'm dealing with more than a few books, freezing is a big deal. So it will, it will delay the problem of mold forming. And so the quicker we can get things frozen, the quicker things stop progressing toward mold, which makes the whole recovery much worse. So this is a picture of an open chest freezer in the Czech Republic. They had major flooding some years ago, and they used all the available freezer space. This is a picture at the British Library in their new building, they actually built in a flash freezer uh, into the building, which gives you an indication of how often libraries actually leak. It's a pretty regular affair, I'm afraid. But good commercial freezers is, are, are really all we're talking about. And you know, given that, that storms are going to cause um, damage in certain, certain areas, I mean, immediately after the storm, you may not know exactly what has been damaged. But thinking outside your immediate region, 
if you think, well, maybe we could get freezer space in Orlando, maybe Fort Myers, you know, I think lining up the possibility of, of um, op optional choices, you know, op um, what am I looking for? Um, anyway, having choices would be really lovely and not having to in invent the wheel, knowing in advance where those might be, could be an advantage. And can all media be frozen? There are discussions in the conservation world about that, and I know I've got you all nervous at this point. What will he say? I won't say anything except mold is going to happen, right? And if it takes us several days to get somewhere, a bunch of mold all over the paintings might be worse than freezing the paintings. And that's a discussion you may want to have in advance. But in my world, freezing books and documents and uh, photographs is perfectly legitimate. It's considered the thing to do. In fact, with the photographs, if I got them frozen before they had a chance to start drying, when we started, uh, we could dry them out a little bit at a time and separate them, and they would not be stuck together. But if they've already started sticking, it's too late. So this is the freezer. Uh, those are the books from Colorado State University. They're boxed in those boxes lined with black plastic garbage bags. You know, this, this freezer is going to hold ultimately almost a half a million books, and so they're stacked up as high as we could stack them. Notice that they're stacked next to frozen peas, and so they, and they were molding. It took 14 days to, to pack out that library, and mold started after day three. So everything after day three was worse mold. And so I talked to the person running the freezer, and I said, you know, do you worry about the, the frozen food? He says, no, oh, no, the peas were, were, were sealed before they were put in here. But I have to tell you, I never eat frozen peas without thinking about it, so for what it's worth. Air drying is the most typical, most common way for people to dry material. It's, um, the director thinks it's, it's free, right? But it's huge labor to do it. So this is me air drying in Hawaii after Hurricane Aniki. Notice the dehumidifier in that little bathroom. So we closed up this room and ran this little dehumidifier, which of course needs to be emptied every, you know, so often and just spread things out. And the, the humidity level in the room was, was, low, uh, was lowered to about 63 or 65%, which is, you know, in Utah considered dripping wet. But in Hawaii, it was actually drying stuff out. So we're just fanning things out. We're shaping things. The hat for uh, back up. The hat, you know, we try and make sure things look pretty good in terms of their physical shape because they may have that shape uh, impressed on them by the drying process. This is my lab uh, some years ago, and the books are just being fanned out. And notice that they're fans. The big deal in um, a closed building, and this is a building that's basically hermetically sealed and air conditioned, is to physically move the air past all the objects, and then the room itself will remove the wet air and exchange it for dry air based on the air conditioning system's pattern. If we have uh, no air conditioner, the same prevails. We have to have as much air movement as possible and as dry a condition as possible. In Utah, it's easy to get evaporation. In Miami, after the big hurricane, it's going to be very humid, and so it's going to be um, tricky. But we can dry lots of stuff if we um, uh, spread it out to dry like this. Notice the paper underneath the books. So again, there's a place for the wet to come out of the bottom of the books and uh, be displaced. I have to tell you, uh, it's those books that I showed you that were arced up on the top of the shelf at Colorado State's um, library flood back in 97. As wet as that, that room was, because the entire room was underwater for 24 hours until they figured out how to get a pump and how to pump the room out. Every book I opened up in that space to, to see what the interior of the book was like, the books were dry in the center. Their, the books tend to wet out at the edges. This is good quality paper. Um, what, what I'm referring to is free sheet which means good printing paper, good writing paper. Um, copy paper is free sheet. Uh, it's not the same as mass market paperbacks, which basically have the same quality paper as newsprint. And they're very absorbent. Newsprint will suck up a lot of water. And so its usefulness here is a place to, just, to allow the water to shed from the wet book into the paper and, and be evaporated up along with the evaporation that's going on for the water leaving the books. 
We can preferentially dry the boards like this. We can preferentially dry some of the pages like that. Those are called velo binding combs. Unfortunately, I don't know where to get those. For a long time, they were available in libraries. It was a quick binding system, like in a in a print shop, like a quick print shop. Uh, Kinko's one of those, um, but they quit making the machines. But they're very handy for doing this kind of thing. I don't know quite where to send you. I've got some here. I'll bring them. Okay, call me. Um, so the trick to the to the dry, air drying process for library material is that paper, when it's wet, when, when a book gets wet. It's wetter on the outer edge, the top, the fore edge, and the, the um, bottom, the head, the tail, and the fore edge, than it is in the center. In fact, the center of the book is often dry. That's not always the case if it's directly under a pipe break. It might be really soaked, but usually the book wets out at the edges and not in the middle. The paper expands and is physically larger than the paper in the middle, and then it distorts. So the reason books cockle is because they're actually physically larger at the edges than they are in the center, which is a byproduct of having gotten wet. It's a weird thing. So we can control that by allowing things to air dry for several days, depends how wet they were, and then squeeze them overnight, and then open them up the next day and allow them to air dry some more. We don't do this until books are dry to the touch, but the difference is the paper feels cold when it actually contains a lot of uh, humidity, a lot of moisture. So the paper is getting to be relatively dry and then we'll squeeze it to to minimize the distortion and then fan it back open and it'll go back to distorting again but it'll continue air drying and then we'll squeeze it again that's the labor in air drying that my director doesn't know about um, we can also air dry like this so we can put documents out like that we can um, put uh, framed objects out like this if things are framed and they the frame got wet it's um, a package that's going to trap moisture it's really hard for the uh, water to evaporate out and so it's likely to cause mold the problem with framed objects as many of you know is the f the way things were actually um, attached to the mat and the way the mats were actually put inside the frame varies a lot and as you can see here there's signs of tape i think i'm not sure i wasn't there this is a picture from somebody else but it's not in, uh, uncommon to see things taped in with three kinds of tape, and uh, it's kind of nightmarish. She had no idea that was going on behind the nice frame, uh, behind the glass. But so taking things apart, if you're not familiar with framing and it's all wet, is really uh, not advisable. I would recommend that you get uh, people on the team who have dealt with framed objects before, who could separate them without damaging them. And even, I think, framers, if you could use uh, people who are used to dealing with the framing uh, concept altogether, just to take things apart, because they'll dry a whole lot better if they're separated. And if you think it's going to be damaged because you take it apart, absolutely don't do that. And there'll be a, um, a webinar on, on paintings, I guess, next time. Um, this is Ontario after a flood in the archives of Ontario that happened one Christmas. And they had about 25,000 boxes of records get wet. So they dried the stuff in the city, actually out on the outskirts of the city. And these are big desiccant dehumidifiers. And so they're um, sucking air in from the outside. And it's kind of moist. It was like moist and wet outside. But it, it was putting dry air inside this vacant grocery store, big abandoned building that could be used. And it was used for a year to dry all that material. The way desiccant uh, dehumidifiers work, there's a big desiccant wheel. See the, the rotor? So the idea is we suck air from one source, like outside, and the air is passed through this um, wheel. And it, the desiccant is like desiccants in your vitamin pills uh, when you get a bottle of vitamins. Basically, they're water absorbent salts. And so this wheel will suck the water out of the air and it'll put nice dry air into that big uh, empty space. And the heat from the system will dry out the wheel again, allowing it to continue to um, remove water from the air. So desiccant dehumidification is definitely a tool and it's highly recommended for uh, an aftermath from a hurricane. And the people that uh, own these or can get access to these 
are often commercial uh, disaster recovery companies. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later too. This is inside that big vacant grocery store building that, uh, so they just set up weird rickety um, racks. I'm sorry about the quality of the images, but you get the idea. They're just spreading out um, boxes and boxes of paper documents and um, running fans and the air that the fans are blowing past all those documents is basically 25% relative humidity. And so they could, in fact, pick specific boxes to dry based on the need um, back at the Ontario um, archive. And so people could call for documents and they would be dry and in their hands in a few days, which is kind of a neat thing to be able to pr uh, provide. They also dried cassette tapes. So that's magnetic media, which is not going to stick together. Um, negatives, film negatives. This is gelatin as the, the, the image is embedded in gelatin on that polyester strip of film. This is film. Film will stick together. The gelatin is, is adhesive. And so the gelatin will uh, bond those together if they're not separated. These, again, are sound recordings. This is magnetic media. So we have to differentiate between what's going to stick and what isn't going to stick is in terms of your having um, a set of priorities. Magnetic media is not going to be a problem. Film is. And upstairs from that, that flooded basement that where almost a half a million books got wet one afternoon, the whole rest of the building was hermetically sealed. So there's four, four floors of the building, and the air conditioning system uh, was, was broken when the flooding happened. The machine crashed, and it broke a, a drive shaft. It took uh, about eight or nine days to repair. And so in the interim, the rest of the building had to be dehumidified to keep it from molding. And uh, at some point, the books were starting to expand from the humidity upstairs. So it's wise to remember that there's going to be consequences throughout a building when one event, a large event happens. This is um, thermal drying. I'm, in, I'm, I'm sharing it with you because we did it, um, a project and we compared what was known about the drying techniques and two sterilization techniques, um, trying to define what would be optimal in uh, a recovery. Does one technique damage things more than another? And the only reason I bring up thermal drying is that in fact it was used in the Florence flood which is now 50 years ago and so the, it, it was the best we knew at the time which was to take the books out of the wet building and pack them off in trucks and these were very rare books. Packed them off in trucks and they put them in a place like this in Italy. This one is in the Czech Republic. My partners for this research project were the British Library and the Czech National Library and um, Sterogenics, a sterilization company, and Belfour, Kirk Lively at Belfour. Anyway, we got access to a kiln that was used for drying lumber in the Czech Republic. And so they put the books for this experiment, we, and we dried things in different places by uh, different means, but we damaged them all the same. So we put them on racks inside this kiln, and they were separated by Holitex and um, ceramic tiles with a weight on top. We closed the door, and we uh, allowed the um, hot air to come through this. And I'm going to show you the results at the end. But uh, needless to say, when you heat things up, it damages them. So I'm not recommending thermal drying. I'll come back to it. The standard in our field, in my, you know, the, the library field, for drying masses of books is vacuum freeze drying. And that came after the Florence flood. We finally figured it out. And it's kind of remarkable. The idea is that we can take um, an object, put, put it inside of a container, and pull a vacuum. In the vacuum, if, if there was water in this object, the water will, cannot exist. It's in a va the vacuum is below the triple point for water. And what that refers to is on the planet Earth, we have water in three states at all times. We have um, ice at the caps, and we, we like having ice at the caps. We have steam in the clouds, and we have water in the lakes and oceans. If, if we went in space, you know, and could step out of our space capsule and throw out that, that old cup of coffee, because we're just tired of that coffee, so I just throw it out, out into space, which is a vacuum, it can't exist as a liquid as it did inside the capsule. So it's going to, um, become ice. It can't exist as a liquid. It, below the triple point, water can only exist as 
vapor as steam or as ice. So in fact, what we do to speed up the process is take a bunch of wet material, that's Kirk Lively some years ago at Belfour, putting books, uh, and these are actually Colorado State University books, into a big vacuum chamber. Notice the ribs, the metal ribs of this steel chamber to keep it from imploding when we pull a vacuum in there. We can, in fact, restrain the books. They'll dry flatter if we uh, limit their uh, ability to just, um, what, to, to have cockle. So we can minimize the cockling. But if we do that, it takes much longer to dry things, like double the time. So it costs more money. It's just something to be aware of. And so the, the books are put inside this chamber. We pull, and they're in fact frozen first to save time. If we pull the vacuum once we put wet books in there, those books would eventually freeze. It takes a while though. So we're putting frozen books into this chamber, pulling a vacuum, and, and then adding a little bit of energy, a little bit of heat, and that causes sublimation to happen. So sublimation is the process of turning the ice crystals in the frozen books to vapor, and then the vapor is pulled out of that machine on the back end and it's gathered up um, and, the, you know, what it's expelled. The vapor is expelled from the machine. So over time, the, the books dry out. It's not, you know, it, it, it depends how wet the books were as to how long that will take. It could be a week if things are really wet. It could be a little longer. At the British Library, they have this little uh, vacuum freeze drying chamber and they've included a little, um, what do you call this? Uh, um, normally in a crowd, someone would help me. At this age, I'm telling you, someone has to help me with these things. A jack, a little jack. I'm doing my best, sorry. So, and, and they, they uh, open up the chamber after a couple of days, check the condition of the books, and put the pressure back on with the jack and put, it, put the books back in, uh, in a vacuum and continue the sublimation process. So you can see there's a little metal edge um, on, that looks like it's part of the jack. It's actually a metal plate that they have between those books to give them some flat surface to uh, press against and the books dry in this chamber really pretty well. It's wonderful. Vacuum packing is um, a little different. It sounds kind of the same, but the way this works is like the way we vacuum pack either sweaters or food. So here we're putting a bunch of absorbent material, newspaper, around a wet book. And if the book had a, coated, a coating on uh, the cover, if the, if the binding was a publisher's cloth bindings, binding, those have starch in, in the uh, cloth, and the starch is definitely going to stick to things like the newspaper. So again, wrapping things in, in a Holitex sheet will allow water to pass through the Holitex. It's water permeable. It's a spun poly polyolefin that allows the water to come through it, but the adhesives won't stick to it. It'll stain it, but it won't stick to it. Anyway, we put absorbent material around the book next, if you're going to have something separating the adhesive. Put it in that bag, and then put it in the machine, and the machine sucks all of the air out and actually creates a vacuum inside the bag. In a complete vacuum, mold will not form. So kind of freezing is a tool and vacuum is a tool for, for um, stopping mold growth. It doesn't kill it, stops it from growing. In that condition, the um, bag would now, uh, you could set the bag aside and come back to it in a few days or a week, and it's not going to grow mold, where in fact in a black plastic garbage bag, a, a wet book, if you set it aside for a week, is definitely going to grow mold. We, um, the, the, the water in the book will travel by capillary action through the holitex and through the, into the newsprint. And so that newspaper is going to get very wet. And so we have to open up the bag and repeat the process of putting dry paper around it and resealing it. And this process may take 20 different times of doing that. But in fact, things dry very flat because of the pressure. And uh, if we control the pressure while the water is being evacuated from the cellulose, the paper will dry flat. Okay. Finally got it out. A little version of that is the vacuum press. That that um, the vacuum vacuum uh, system that I just showed you uh, was developed in England, and those machines cost like twelve thousand or fifteen thousand dollars. This little press is three hundred dollars, so it's pretty cheap. 
in, in this case, Jeff is interleaving newsprint in this book, and that about every ten pages, eight or ten, something like that, and wrapping uh, newsprint around it, and then putting it in this bag, sealing the bag. That edge is resealable, but that's one of the problems. It also tends to want to pop open and leak. And then with that little vacuum in the background, sucking the air out. It's not going to keep all the air out, so it, it will probably mold. But this will also dry things. While we were busy doing this experiment and um, comparing how things were being dried, the Czechs were dealing with the real flood that they had had, which was actually several countries and um, really massive flooding. Uh, across Europe and especially in the Czech Republic. So they developed this machine, the multifunctional vacuum chamber. It's the only one in the world. And um, it very fortunate for them that they had Willy Wonka on staff to help them with the development of this. It does lots and lots of things. It's a very complex machine and interesting. So it, it can circulate air in the side of the machine. It can pull a vacuum, in which case there is no air. It can circulate a sterilization material inside the machine. It can do tricks. It's wonderful. So the way it works is the books are put on, um, they're frozen, they're, they're separated in, um, onto ceramic uh, tiles, and there may be holotex between them if there's going to be um, an adhesive coating in the cloth. And they're stacked up in a rack, that metal rack, that allows the same size, relative size of books to be organized in the chamber. They have racks in three different sizes. So there you see the ceramic tile. In this case, there's no holotex, I don't think. And then, you know, in America, when, when we're trying to figure out if the freeze drying process was carried out correctly, we have one monitor inside the, that huge vacuum drying chamber um, to, to tell us if we stayed below the triple point or when we came above it. And the Czechs, however, wanted to know specifically every book's drying state at every moment of time. And so they actually have running records of every single book in the chamber as it goes along. The Czechs are, are just amazing, actually, my experience. Very, very bright people with a really difficult language. Here they're sealing it up, and then they're going to pull a vacuum. So that was just for fun. We can't use it. It's only there. Sterilization. Sterilization is a topic that we need to talk about because, in fact, not everything, not every body of water is going to be clean. So sometimes the water is going to come through the building and it's going to be, say, you know, full of uh, building material and, and insulation and all this other stuff. But if there's standing water, if you've got a huge flood situation and there's standing water, and I remember in my youth hurricane scenarios where there was pl plenty of standing water, uh, prior to storms and during the storms, what happens is sewage rises in a, when there's a standing water condition. The, um, the pressure from the standing water allows the sewage to just rise up out of the sewers. And so you could, in fact, have basements that are full of sewage. And the question about whether it's going to be safe if we dry this material to hand it back to people to use is, is a real question. However, you, people are usually really agitated about the idea of mold on stuff, so they're not happy about that. I'm actually going to make a case in a couple of minutes about not wanting to kill the mold, but learning to live with mold, but that's, that's kind of an uphill story and, and maybe difficult. But certainly I would say if there's a health risk involved, it's worth considering sterilization. And for instance, the Colorado State University flood, where almost a half a million books uh, were wet and most of those molded and by the time you know we put all those books back inside that basement the question of all that dry mold it's not active but it's it's desiccated mold what's that going to do to people there was definitely a concern about sterilization and in fact in that instance they did sterilize those books um, a way to sterilize uh, that they use all over the world and uh, is very effective is to put things in a vacuum chamber and fill the vacuum chamber full of ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is absolutely poisonous. There's no doubt about it. It's really, really hard to kill mold. It's easy to stop mold from actively growing, but it's really difficult to kill. Ethylene oxide will do that. Um, people, however, are afraid of ethylene oxide 
because of a variety of reasons that um, I don't think those are, are legitimate. I'll, I'll make the case. I, I can't hear your groans. So if someone has a case to make in the reverse, I hope you'll go ahead and state it. But this is my position. And I, I came to it um, uh, kicking and screaming, I guess. Uh, Francois Fleder in France cornered me at a conference once and, and asked me, what's with you Americans? Why is it you're not, why is it you're so afraid of ethylene oxide? And she was the woman who did the testing for it, the chemical testing, the physical strength test, testing for paper um, after ethylene oxide sterilization back in the 60s. And so she, I thought she made a valid point. And so I started inquiring about it. And so for our study, we put ethylene oxide into the study and compared it with the other sterilization technique. The thing to know about sterilization is nobody can do it in the backyard. There are standards. There's, you know, um, the EPA has standards and, the, and OSHA have standards. And people who do sterilization on a commercial level meet those standards and they include um, off-gassing the, the material after the sterilization occurs. And in fact, the sterilization media, the ethylene oxide, is pumped out first and it's destroyed uh, by burning it. So in, there's got to be an aeration phase and that's that by definition from OSHA is um, two days, 48 hours. We had a person from Sterogenics on our committee on this group who did this research and so she's in the business of doing sterilization and uh, was not, um, dis uses both, uses both ethylene oxide and, and um, gamma radiation, which is the next slide. Gamma radiation is also possible. This is a slide from a, a sterilization, a, a gamma radiation chamber in France. If you go looking on the internet for these things, they're not easy to come by. They think you're trying to do something uh, untoward. But in fact, the way it works is you put a, a, a box of material, say books, on this little track that's out in front of that, that, that big machine is a lead box. On the left side is a track that goes through the center of the machine, past the core of nuclear material, and out the other side. And when it passes by the nuclear material, the um, radiation passes through everything and, and uh, chops up the mold at, at a molecular level and it chops up the cellulose at a molecular level. That has consequences. I'll show you them. Uh, first, we're going to look at the physical outcome of drying. You can see from this slide, these, these books um, are machine-made paper. In, in practice, machine-made papers are everything after 1850. The first machine was built in 1803. It started production um, about then, and the technology expanded rather rapidly, but you know, rapidly in the 19th century meant it took 20 years. And so after 20 years of, of expansion, it was starting to displace handmade paper, but by 1850, it's pretty well done that. But there's still handmade paper in 1850, and there's still handmade paper today. But largely when you find books after 1800, uh, somewhere between 1800 and 1850, there's maybe a, 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 a question, but you can tell by looking at it, sort of. Certainly after 1850 or so, most of it's machine made, which means it has a grain direction. And that's what you're seeing in the cockling is a combination of the fact that the, the book got uh, preferentially larger at the outside edges than it is in the center of the book and it has a, a grain direction running through it. But air drying is perfectly reasonable. Vacuum freeze drying is perfectly reasonable. The thermal drying, you can't tell too much, but you can see at the edge it looks a little brown. That's where the cellulose got cooked, and that's bad for the sizing and bad for the cellulose. The vacuum packing came out nicely, and the vac vacuum press came out nicely. With handmade paper, all the techniques work fine. Again, the thermal drying in the center looks a little brown on the edge because it's cooking it. This chart is difficult to read, but if you look at the 1.0 line, that's basically our baseline. And so we had noise in the data because we w worked with, with real books. I was really key, keen on getting examples of real books drying and real books reacting to different drying techniques but that gave us some kinds of variations in the data because actually with real books, there's different papers from the beginning of the book to the end of the book in some cases. And certainly, uh, so there, there's some variation. 
but the 1.0 line is basically non-damaging and you know half certainly air drying is considered non-damaging in fact everything is considered within reason for uh, drying until we get to thermal drying which lost 20 percent of the strength of the cellulose and this is um, tested through fold endurance and burst test standard tests for t uh, testing the strength of paper and gamma radiation the paper lost 25 percent of its physical strength and what that means is that they're broken um, molecules inside of the paper at this point that are going to continue to break down at a faster rate than the books the b dried or sterilized by the other methods so this is a bit of information that we didn't know before we did this testing um, moving on because we have no time to waste um, the idea of of you know everything is not water sometimes it's soot this is a fire that was an arson uh, set fire at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And the premise is we're dealing with, uh, in some cases, just a soot problem. They're probably going to be wet too because uh, the firemen are going to be in there. This floor of the library was not sprinklered. The upper floors were, which lets you know that the um, arsonist absolutely knew where to set the fire. Arsonists are tough because they actually are working overtime to figure out what's going to be damaging. So the problem is soot is not dust. Soot is actually uncombusted byproducts of the fire, which can include particle board, can include insulation, and can include paint, plastic tables, all kinds of stuff that's only partially combusted, meaning it didn't quite turn all the way to carbon, and you're stuck with all this goopy stuff. And the goopy stuff settles on material and it gets harder to remove over time. And it smells bad. So I got a chance to figure out an alternative to the normal technique for cleaning, which is to use a rubber sponge. Natural rubber sponges are the standard in the cleaning profession. They'll go in after a fire and they'll wipe the walls and the furniture and everything with this natural rubber sponge and tear open the sponge to get a clean section in the middle and start again and they just basically are moving the soot off by abrasion on the rubber sponge. In this case, it's hard to see that these books have soot all over them. The fire was up in the attic. It was set by a welder, and the, he set the um, back of the insulation, uh, that pink insulation that is paper-backed. He set that paper backing on fire, and it burned like a fuse and put itself out, which is fortunate because it didn't burn the roof of the building, which was uh, wood. It could have easily done. But in this case, the books all smell of soot. The entire building smells of soot. And the longer it sits, the harder it's, it's going to be to remove it. So we tried cleaning it with um, dry ice misting. This is a machine for doing that. This is a block of dry ice. It's just a block of frozen CO2. The machine that it's being placed in is, uh, has a grinding wheel at one end. And it's going to grind that block of frozen CO2 to the size of sugar. It's then going to expel it through this nozzle. Look, look at the very top of the nozzle where there's a little bit of shadow. You can kind of see in the shadow just a teeny bit of uh, gray area. That's the dry ice being pushed out at about 20 pounds per square inch. 15 to 20 is kind of typical. And it's coming out of that nozzle and it's getting on this book. And the deal is dry ice is extremely cold. You've got to handle it with gloves. And when it, it is in tiny, tiny particle form, it's preferentially freezing the top of that book. So where the soot is all over the top surface, it's coating the outside of the book. This dry ice is actually freezing that. And those crystals, those little tiny uh, uh, sugar-sized uh, granules of CO2, frozen CO2, are turning to gas. And they, they expand like 800 times their original size. So it's not only getting the surface really cold, but pushing everything away as the, um, the crystal is turning to gas. And that's the cleaning result, left side, of course, being the clean side. It's really pretty interesting. And it can get around corners and you know up in head caps, the parts of books that are kind of tough to clean. I think it's a very interesting technology. It's uh, a, more expensive to use than uh, sponges, but I think it does a better job. And it can be abrasive. It can be like um, 
uh, sandblasting. So here you see when the dwell is too long in one spot or the, the distance between the nozzle and the book was too close, we can remove the uh, color from the cloth or we can actually take the stamping off the spine of the book. So it can be abrasive. Uh, so it's got to be handled by somebody who's uh, capable of knowing how to use it. So now I get to do the mitigating mold talk. Okay. I like this. It's, that's a crummy slide. I apologize for it. But it shows something interesting as a beginning point. Um, notice that there are lots of plants and animals. We're one of the animals. And the fungi are a whole different group. It's a whole different category. And it's, it's kind of hard to imagine that nature was somehow negligent in creating the, the fungi when it developed 100,000 species of them, right? And even among those, I think some of those can be subdivided again and again into smaller subsets. It's quite remarkable. There's a huge body of uh, life on this planet that we don't even notice, and it's around us all the time. The mold uh, spores are in the air. We breathe about eight on average an hour. Their mold is, exists um, at the poles. It exists at the uh, equator. And uh, so it's all over the planet all the time. It's here. It's part of us. Maybe it's the source of us. I don't really know. But it's weird and beautiful and strange and dangerous to some extent. But I think we need to, to learn, you know, Lions are dangerous. That doesn't mean we kill all the lions, right? There's rattlesnakes in the world. In fact, there are buzzards in the world, and that's maybe what mold is closer to. If you think about it, I don't think nature was making a big mistake. I think it was figuring out a way to make sure that there are no dead horses lying around. I live out here in the West, so maybe that analogy makes more sense. But, you know, we, I don't drive around big open areas out here and experience just a bunch of horses lying around dead just waiting to be you know consumed the vultures take care of the big parts and the ants take care of the littler parts and the molds are going to take care of some of it too and all those different varieties are doing something all the time and in my estimation and i'm i'm going to anthropomorphize mold i'm going to kind of give it human characteristics for the point of this discussion to me, it seems like it's either sleeping or it's working, right? Simple enough. It's interesting. It, under a microscope, it kind of looks like that. Those little balls on the end of that stalk, the stalk kind of makes it look like a little tree, um, but that, that is how it reproduces. So in some instances, the mold gets a signal to go to work, and when it does feel like things are good and it's busy thriving, it does this uh, asexual um, uh, breeding. The canidia are spread by um, on the air currents and basically they land near the object that the first mold is working on and they all go to town. So when we see bread mold, for instance, it kind of looks like this. Again, it's not a plant, so we're looking at the roots, but they're not really roots. Plants have roots. Mold has, I don't know, something. It's They're absorbers, right? They, it sinks its absorber down into the bread and is busy consuming. It's actually absorbing the bread, digesting it. So it makes it weaker and basically is trying to get rid of what it considers, I'm gonna call it dead bread, right? The dead horses don't, don't wanna exist on the planet. The earth is trying to turn stuff back to carbon so it can grow more good flowers on the planet. But, um, so the mold is part of the process. OK, moving on. The problem is, of course, you don't want the mold on your collection. So in between the two points of knowing that nature is going to do what seems right to keep the planet wholesome, and we're trying to preserve stuff, which is maybe working against the grain slightly, um, there's a middle ground. And so I saw examples of it in Biloxi after Hurricane Katrina. We would see, for instance, this is the pu public library in Biloxi. And we, we went in there three weeks after the storm, and we're busy walking around on all those pine needles. They're about like a foot and a half thick. So it was like walking on a big mattress. Very weird. But there's no mold anywhere in the library at the point that we visited this. I have to tell you, later, that library was lost to mold completely. So the building had to be destroyed, and they built a new building in Biloxi for the public library. But three weeks after the storm, you'll notice the windows have been damaged, right? So there's airflow through the building. 
but certain parts of the building didn't have airflow. This is an exhibit case uh, in one part of the library that had baskets in it, and that gray fuzz all over the baskets is mold. It's just a glass case up on uh, metal legs, so it's, it didn't get wet from the floor, you know, directly wet. It got wet because the place is extremely humid and it's inside of this glass box. Another place I started to see mold growing where there were boxes was like in the map cabinets, right? That's all mold, it's rust and mold. But so places that are closed up seem to be suspiciously susceptible to mold. And this is a Tyvek bag. This, this book came out of a file cabinet and it was stored next to other books quite similar that were stored in paper uh, envelopes, and the paper envelopes didn't uh, have mold all over them like this Tyvek envelope did. Tyvek is a plastic, so basically we have a, a book that's now gotten wet inside of a plastic container, and it's high humidity conditions, and it's not breathing. So breathing is the key to it in my anthropomorphized view. If I think about my lungs, they're, they're a perfect place for mold to grow. They're very wet, they're warm, and they're dark. And if I'm breathing eight spores a min an hour, sorry, eight spores an hour, what's to prevent me from breaking out in mold inside my lungs? And I, I actually asked a doctor who said, oh, I've seen that. <laughs> so maybe anything is possible, right? I don't put it past the planet to do anything at once. But in general, I don't have a mold problem in my lungs. And if we don't want to have a mold problem in our buildings, I'm suggesting create the breath of life. Move the air around. You've got to create drafting, create sources of, of air, and as much as possible. So we want to control the relative humidity, bringing it down, and we want to control the movement of air, which will also help absorb the water off of the surfaces of things but I think it also sends a message to the mold, which is, oh, I'm, I guess I'm not supposed to go to work yet. It's not quite dead yet, right? And so the mold goes through that Monty Python bit, not dead yet, and uh, the spores actually go back to sleep. They don't die, but they stop actively working. So um, I grant you this is a simplistic way of looking at mold, but I think in the field you'll find it works. Um, to the extent that it's possible. And it's gonna be a struggle to figure out how to get airflow in a place that has no electricity, how to get um, dehumidification, you know. But by the way, dehumidifiers can be powered by uh, portable um, generators and so can fans and th this can be done. When mold does grow, we can remove it with a uh, HEPAVAC so it does not come spurting out the back because mold spores are incredibly small. So using a HEPAVAC, we can uh, remove it, but in library world, we actually don't do much for the staining. It's possible if it's a Rembrandt that the staining can be reduced, but in essence, when mold happens, the staining is part of it. It's not just um, a different color, the fiber has been damaged, and so it's also weaker, and at some point gets really weak. So here's Jeff working in a fume hood, because of course, breathing mold is not good for you. In uh, the simplest of terms, it can just be brushed away, but you should be outdoors doing this so you don't have, you're not breathing the, um, the result. Um, so outdoors with the wind coming over your shoulder, once the mold has dried, you can just brush it away. And that's the desiccated parts that were growing and now have just basically collapsed on themselves and can be uh, brushed off. Um, it doesn't work with living mold. If the mold is still uh, active, it'll smear when you try and brush it away. My ending note, I have two tiny points to end with. One is the idea of policy creation. I know I'm addressing a really diverse group here, and I'm so proud of you for bonding together to try and think out the strategies to um, beat the hurricanes at their own game, try and stabilize things. In, I want to offer up, up an idea. In Utah, we created something called um, an annex to the state's emergency plan. So in, in essence, the state now, and we, every state has a, uh, an emergency plan. In fact, I, I'm sure Miami has a, its own emergency plan. Within the state of Utah's emergency plan, there's now an appendix, if you will, an annex, 
that talked specifically about recovery of cultural property. And these are the groups that got together, State Archives being kind of a lead group, and uh, helped drive this into creation. There were two states in the union that beat us to this punch. We just modeled after them. Colorado has asked for our documents. It, and if you're interested, I'm happy to share uh, Utah's plans with uh, Florida. We'd be delighted to see the idea spread. So in fact, our annex is to ESF 11, which is the cultural property annex, along with uh, natural resources. The second idea I wanted to share is, uh, oh, and by the way, backing up one, one touch, the, the idea that you could have a pre-existing um, documentation that, that makes it essential, I think is a pressure point to getting people to consider the idea of contracting with um, uh, disaster recovery companies. The thing you can do with a disaster recovery company is A, pay them with insurance money or with FEMA money if you've documented your, your case well enough. And they, they can come in uh, at the drop of a hat and they can do a tremendous amount of work under your guidance and can be very effective at speeding things up, i.e. getting stuff into the freezers, for instance, in Orlando or Tallahassee. The last thing is prevention. And I know it's not your jobs, maybe, to be able to prevent stuff from being damaged, but I want to go back to Florence for just a half a second. These, this is a picture that appeared in National Geographic after the flood. So this is 50 years ago. This is a conservator looking in a hallway full of vellum books. It's all animal skin. Vellum is animal skin. We talk about you know parchment documents and stuff, and, and people point to actually paper. But this is actual, you know, these are 13th and 14th and 15th century books. They're illuminated manuscripts, which means that they're worth Fifty thousand to five hundred thousand dollars, probably fifty to two hundred would be a fair bet in today's market, I guess. But they're valuable. There's a whole hallway full of them. This is probably millions of dollars worth of books that were below the waterline in a city that floods historically about every one hundred years, and you can go back and see the watermarks on the buildings. What are we doing storing vellum books under the waterline? when we know things below the waterline can be affected if there's a flood. It's just a question, right? It's just a question. But the problem with this slide is it these books will not dry like paper. Every one of those books will cockle up in a ridiculous way, and the cost to flatten it out again is probably so prohibitive that they'll never be flattened. So the, all of these books will be essentially ruined forever because of not thinking to put them on the second floor. You know, even so, for what it's worth. And this, so part of that is where in the building the, the material resides, where the building itself sits on, you know, on Biscayne Bay versus, you know, inside the city somewhere. And what kind of protections are around those objects? What would shed water? Any box will shed water up to a certain point. And so boxing is highly recommended for library and archival and photographic material. And I think generally, it's just, and the idea of a valuable book, maybe it needs a box within a box. So that's where I want to stop. All right, thank you, Randy. That was incredible. Um, so many wonderful visuals to share with the group. Um, I see, I, I think, maybe some questions getting typed right now. Um, one thing I wanted to pass along to you when you were um, having the conversation about um, the Utah Annex, uh, Steve Detweiler, who is a co-chair of the Alliance for Response Group in South Florida, um, and with the Office of Emergency Management, just wanted to point out that the Alliance for Response there is included in um, the ESF 11, or ESF 18, I'm sorry, um, which is business and industry uh, annex. Wow, for, business, that's um, good. Uh, yeah, and that's, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the, for the Miami-Dade uh, Office of Emergency Management. Um, Mr. Detweiler, I take my right. hat off to you, sir, and thank you for your work. I, I can't thank you <laughs> enough. Pull, pull together whatever, Steve does great yeah, whatever we can do to help you in that regard. I just think that's fabulous, fabulous. Um, so we had a question um, from Isabel. She's wondering, what are some other commercial disaster response companies besides Belfour? Um, Randy, do you want to speak to experiences that you've had with 
any other companies? Yeah, there's okay. Th this is that's a loaded question, so I have to tell you. It is. Yes, <laughs> it is. I I will say this in round terms. I will say if you want some specific information, if you want me to actually spill the beans, you want to call me on the phone. We'll talk. I was. I, I used to go around telling people specifically what was wrong with some companies that I've dealt with. I can say generically, I've seen companies come on site and um, do incredible price gouging. I've seen companies come on site and be very uh, promised lots and lots and lots of things, and people were, you know, walking on cloud nine. And when they left, everybody wondered, you know, what happened. Right? It's like, you know, the love affair that went went completely wrong. Um, there are, are good guys and bad guys in this field. In fact, my experience on the ground has been it's kind of a difficult area to police because um, some emergency uh, responding companies seem to float around from like a circus from event to event and never quite land at home. And if you wanted to talk to them, um, there, there could be problems. With that, I've seen people get cheated uh, that were that were um, uh, what do you call that? Um, when I'm hired by somebody else, chime in. Um, a, co a contractor. I, I was a contractor. I was cheated before. Um, promised monies, paid money up front to be able to fly to a disaster to help people. Was promised my expenses would be paid and that I was actually going to be compensated for my time, and I was summarily cheated. Things can be not quite as represented. And so it's my opinion that companies should be vetted by people who've had, had experiences. I have personal experiences. I know other people have different experiences. There are companies um, that I could name, but I, what I would say to you is I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to say the <laughs> University of Utah through considered uh, evaluation, chose uh, Belfour um, some years ago as the com company that it will um, deal with in an emergency. And it first dealt with just museums and libraries. And it has since actually signed uh, an agreement with them for the whole campus because I live in an earthquake zone and we have a chemistry building on campus that's absolutely going to turn uh, to be a nightmare if all the chemistry falls on the floor. The clouds of gray smoke coming out of that building are going to be deadly. We have a little nu nuclear reactor on campus we don't talk about, but it's absolutely safe. I've been told many times, absolutely safe. But there are things that bring the university to want to be able to go back to business very quickly. And so for that big emergency, for that earthquake, we want to know who we're in the trench with and uh, it comes with some years of experience. And um, so I can honestly say that the University of Utah felt uh, comfortable choose selecting Belfour for that particular role. And I also think you can find conservators. So a, a, a commercial company can only do so much. They can help you move quantities of stuff. I didn't say it well, quantities of stuff. They can help you board up the building. They can help you dehumidify the building. They can help you rip out the wet wallboard and get all the wet carpet up and out of the building so things don't, you know, really mold. They can do some really gross things and do them fast. Gross, I mean, you know, large. Um, and it's very, very helpful if you have people around you who actually are experienced at doing this kind of work who can help you. Um, it's also helpful to tell a company what you need them to do and why you want to do it. So um, having conservators on the ground acting as advisors can help you in the negotiation with the insurance company and can help you with the and FEMA and can help you with the um, uh, formalizing the, the path of uh, quickest response or most most logical response. And people do have specialty areas. So it's my sense that um, people have different strengths and and knowing that you could get different mileage out of people who who are familiar with paintings over books when it was paintings that are damaged i it would lead me to want to have paintings people involved does that help i think that's an excellent answer and a very diplomatic one too um i've i've had some folks ask in the past about recommendations for 
working with specific companies. And, you know, I would just echo what you said and um, a point that you raised early on in your presentation about the importance of uh, vetting anyone early on and establishing those contracts as far ahead of any possible event. Um, because then you'll you'll have more control over the process. And I will just say that um, there are some team members of the National Heritage Responders um, who are exploring um, this, this topic of how to ask the right questions of um, a recovery company, for example, to make sure that they're using appropriate treatments for uh, different materials in your collection. Uh, so the kind of working on developing a guide, more or less, um, for collecting institutions, and I think that they're looking to perhaps do a webinar with the Connecting to Collections Care online community next year, or uh, publish some articles in uh, allied organizations. So I'll be sure to share that information I, with the group. I would love um, to know more about that, that too. Better. That's a step forward. That's great. Yeah, definitely. Because as Randy was saying, you know, um, conservators who have the the familiarity with the materials would be able to you know, ask those right questions about the activities that are happening there. Uh, and Isabel says, uh, thank you. Randy, You're most welcome. Answer. Um, if anyone else had any other questions, I encourage you to go ahead and uh, drop those in the chat box now. Uh, I had a, a quick one. Um, and I know that, you know, this, this subject of book and paper materials is going to be one that I would imagine everyone who's in the program would uh, have something of that effect in their collection somewhere. Um, so, you know, recognizing that there's probably a diversity of objects people would be concerned about. Um, Randy, I was wondering if you might share some tips for just basic, basic supplies that everyone should have in any go kit that they would be using to respond to uh, a water event within their institution. So what would you recommend for interleaving or, um, you know, anything that you would think would be necessary for, for managing that first response phase? <laughs> I, I preface this by saying um, I, I work in a conservation lab. We have a lot of stuff here already. So in fact, I don't, I don't think so much of having separate kits as um, I think one of the keys to, to, the res to, to an effective response is communication. And for instance, that picture I showed you from the old Mississippi State Capitol, there, they had a plan in place that people, as soon as they could get into the museum, were in that storage room trying to figure out what was going on. And in fact, the storage room, right, Murphy's Law, their, their actual storage room was the place that was leaking. So, oh, no. but the fact that they were there quickly, they didn't, I think they lost two things or something, very little loss. Things were, you know, damaged. Everything gets damaged. I think that's also a reality I just want to emphasize. It's been a bad day if you've had one of these events. Nothing is ever going to be the same after it goes through one of these events. We do the best we can. We have to accept the fact that, you know, if you get hit by a car, you're maybe going to limp for the rest of your life. It's the way it's going to go. But, we're, but we can improve the reaction time. You know, if you lay in the, uh, in the street for 24 hours, the limp is going to be a whole different th thing than if you can actually get to a hospital within the next nine minutes. So I think there's there um, part of it is the speed of understanding what are we up against, what has actually happened. As far as the actual stuff, I think sheet plastic, sheets of plastic. You know, we buy the rolls of plastic at a, um, a big hardware store, and they're maybe forty dollars a roll, and we pre-cut them to sizes that in library world fit over the top of shelving. And shelving comes in different sizes, but we pre-package it into boxes. We cut it and then fold it down and put it near the place that it would be needed. And uh, so, in fact, it's a little late if we're throwing plastic over something because the water's already flowing. But at least it'll stop that for the moment. And in some cases, the water can't be shut off as quickly as you'd wish. I saw a flood that, in fact, was based on... Uh, we weren't sure it was below ground, but it turned out to be the uh, people were watering the waterbed around the library and forgot to turn the hose off for the weekend. And so the water drained through the building and finally was draining on to the collection. So Monday morning, the water is draining on the collection and we're um, busy covering it up and then figuring out where the water is coming from. But by the time that water was turned off, it still drained for another four or five hours. So plastic can be important as a as a barrier. 
I think the idea of having places that you could take stuff and debating whether or not it should be taken, I didn't really cover this much, but you know, how will you move um, large objects? In the library world, we have book trucks, so we can take wet books by wheels, you know, on wheels upstairs to my lab, and we can spread them all out. If we have too many books, we're going to be packing those into boxes and shipping them to freezers. I don't stock uh, cardboard boxes or pla black plastic garbage bags. I keep counting on the fact that I can go and get those as needed um, because I don't have closets and closets full of space to store a bunch of boxes. But I kind of have an idea of places that have boxes. They produce boxes, whether they'll have any on the floor this moment. That's a variable, but we can check with lots of places, both in the city and surrounding cities, and get those in fairly short order if we have to, if it's a big enough event. So that opens up lines of communication. That's a job. Where are we going to move stuff? Who's going to get us the boxes? What size will they be? Who's going to get us trucks? Where are the black plastic garbage bags? How are we physically moving the books and getting them into those boxes? If we're um, talking about large... I mean, you people have some extraordinary stuff in your collections that is very awkward. It was awkward to get it into the building. and It'll be awkward if it gets wet. It's possible, you know, that the piano is not going to be a, a, a easily moved object no matter how wet it got. So I think you're going to have to come up with some decisions about what can move reasonably and what should be prioritized and things that we're going to basically ignore in the first pass because maybe it won't make much of a difference and we're going to use up all of our strength uh, uh, struggling with that. The only things I really keep, I keep some uh, Vela binding combs, I keep some uh, blotter and uh, Holitex. That's my main tools and uh, I, I don't interleave. I basically have lots of dry air. So I can see modifying this this collection of things, but I think the two eventualities in my world are I've got a few things and they're going to need to be dried and we'll hand dry them. And if we have a huge event, I'm going to get a lot of people collected and they're going to bring resources like boxes and black plastic garbage bags and lots of human beings and trucks. And we're going to uh, move that stuff out of here to freezers. So that's the decision I've made for here. It probably would be different if I lived in Miami and thought about it for a while. Great, that's really helpful. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in at the moment, um, but Randy, I'm wondering if you were so generous as to, to put your contact information on this final slide. Um, are you open to people sending you a, a follow-up note should another question arise down the road? Call, you know, call. Call, call. It's, it's friendlier. And uh, email, it's quicker. And uh, contact me no matter what, fast or slow all the time, day or night. I'll get to you as soon as I can. Sometimes I'm, I'm asleep or unconscious, you know, the sedatives haven't worn off yet. So, but um, I, I'm deeply committed to the idea that uh, South Florida is a tempting target for the hurricanes. I've watched the hurricanes roll over the uh, Caribbean islands for years. And I, I really worry about uh, the way that works. It's a great buffer for the coast of Florida, but um, I'm invested in the process of trying to save uh, cultural property in Florida. So I'm a Floridian. I was born there. So um, count on me. I'd love to help, honestly. And I, if I can, uh, what say something useful? That's that is quick to do. So glad to help. Well, that's very generous of you, Randy. Thank you for that. Um, and of course, thank you for the time that you've uh, committed to putting together this presentation today and sharing your words of wisdom. Um, I'm so grateful, and I, I know the, the folks in the program today are as well. So uh, thank you to everyone for taking the time to, to learn more about this very important topic. Uh, again, feel free to, to follow up with Randy if you have any questions. And, and likewise, uh, if you have any questions for me about the upcoming programs in our series, you all know how to contact me. All right, thanks again, and hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Bye, everybody.